Woman Jenker, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. I'm broadcasting from Corhant Awarabul, uh, the Dandenong Ranges, which was the traditional hunting grounds of the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people. And I'd like to pay my respect to um, traditional owners across the country and uh, their elders past, present and emerging. So before we begin the webinar, just a couple of housekeeping um, matters. First of all, we have two options to engage with us today. One is the chat box. So if you'd like to use the chat box, that's to say, oh, Grant, what a great presentation. If you want to use the Q&A box, that's for putting a question to Grant, which will address those questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can also raise your hand at the end and we can unmute you and you can put your question to Grant in person. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Grant Williamson from the University of Tasmania. And he's also involved with the New South Wales Bushfire Risk Management Research Hub. And he's going to present on uh, his Fire Tools Cloud. I did have a quick look through his slides this morning and um, it looks like it's going to be a very engaging presentation. Over to you, Grant. Thanks, Deb. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Grant Williamson from the University of Tasmania. Uh, I'm also funded by and working with the New South Wales Bushfire Risk Management Research Hub, um, where I'm leading a work package looking at fire regimes in New South Wales and building some innovative tools to analyze them and understand them. Uh, the presentation today is going to be about a tool we've built called Fire Tools Cloud, which is relevant to prescribed burn planning. Um, and it's to look at thresholds of vegetation status um, to understand uh, and identify long unburnt vegetation, vegetation that's vulnerable to subsequent fire and so forth based on fire history and vegetation fire attributes. There we go. Never works the first time. I'll go back to where I was. Okay. So FireTools Cloud is an online GIS processing environment, which calculates what we call vegetation status or heritage threshold status based on vegetation fire attributes and fire history. And by vegetation fire attributes, I'll go into them in more detail, but broadly we're talking about for a given vegetation type, what's the maximum and the minimum interval that it should be burnt at. Uh, and we can use this to understand the state of the vegetation based on that fire history. And classify the vegetation into a number of statuses. Uh, we can identify in this example map here, which is some output from fire tools, long unburnt vegetation, vegetation that's been too frequently burnt, vegetation that's classified as vulnerable. That is, if it was burnt again, then that would be outside of the ideal interval. And we can identify vegetation that's within its appropriate ecological thresholds. Fire tools in its original form has been around for a while in New South Wales parks. Uh, it existed as a plugin for ArcGIS uh, where it would operate on uh, vegetation and fire history layers provided in ArcGIS. Uh, that tool was getting a bit old. It was no longer compatible with the ArcGIS version they were running. So as part of the New South Wales Bushfire Hub program, uh, I was given the task of rebuilding it in a new format. Um, to avoid needing that desktop GIS environment. So what we came up with is called Fire Tools Cloud, which implements the same algorithm, um, but it's been rewritten. Uh, we implemented that algorithm in R and it has a web-based interface. So you just log into the Fire Tools website, you upload what we call a data pack containing the various GIS layers you want to analyze, containing the fire history and the vegetation and so forth. You click go, it will sit there and analyze that data and then send you an email when it's done. And you can go back to the website and download the results. Uh, and through this, because it's performed online in this environment, you don't need desktop GIS to do the processing. You can get lots of analyses going simultaneously at the same time um, and download them when they're all done. Um, and there is some benefit too, in terms of the size of data it can process at once. Um, we can scale up the processing power if you're analyzing a very large region or doing it at a, at a high resolution. Broadly, what we're taking is a layer with the complete fire history for an area. So uh, all the 
burnt area polygons for fires throughout the known history, each tagged with the year in which they burnt. And we're taking a vegetation map uh, with vegetation polygons with each one having an ID which links into those fire attributes I discussed, maximum, minimum, burn intervals, and so forth. Fire Tools uh, combines those together with an algorithm that makes decisions based on that fire history, looking at intervals between fires, looking at time since it was last burnt, and so forth, and produces an output such as this, which is our heritage threshold status map. Um, here's an example output over the Blue Mountains uh, calculated this year. You can see uh, after the 2019-20 fires, large amount of vegetation is vulnerable or too frequently burnt through the core of that area. To go into more detail about what's need to, needed to run fire tools, uh, we have what we term a data pack, which is a zip file containing all the GIS layers you need. Uh, and these layers go into four groups. Um, one lot we call for historical reasons, a corporate layer. And this just contains a polygon boundary of the region you want to analyze. So for New South Wales, for example, we have a, uh, a layer with polygons defining all the various parks regions. And when you run fire tools, you can select which one you want to run an analysis for and the analysis will be restricted to that area. We have, you need to provide a layer with vegetation polygons with an ID code um, for each vegetation type. Uh, fire tools also analyzes fire management zones or fire management blocks um, and implement specific prescribed burning uh, regimes for those areas. And you need a data pack with the fire information. So that's a layer with the fire history polygons, as I said, uh, a lookup table, which links every vegetation type to those ecological attributes, the maximum and minimum interval burning, and also a lookup table for those fire management blocks to define the, the prescribed burning regime you want to maintain. Uh, fire tools can handle a variety of input formats. You can give it um, ESRI geo databases, you can give it ESRI shape files, or you can give it um, open source geo package as the input, and it will handle all of them. And when you run fire tools and you upload a data pack, this is what you see. So this is an example, I've uploaded a data pack containing the data for the Greater Sydney area. Um, within the interface, you can check what's in the data pack to make sure all your layers are there. Or importantly, you can click the green launch analysis button. So once your data is uploaded, you can then go onto a screen where you define what your layers are. It's essentially telling, telling the tool, okay, this layer here contains my uh, fire management zones. This layer here contains the fire history. This field contains the year that the area burnt. Um, and once it has all that, you can click go on the analysis and it will send it off for processing. Um, you can also provide information about the geographic projection you want it to work in. So you can use your local um, uh, datum projection for the region you're analyzing. You can specify the required resolution, whether you want it done, the output as a 25 meter or 100 meter or maybe a 500 meter resolution raster if you're doing large areas at once. And importantly, you can also define the base year of the analysis. Um, normally this would be the current year, but you can actually put in a future year and it will then adjust the analysis to show you, you know, given this fire history, what will the vegetation status be in five or 10 years time? The algorithm itself, the actual determination of the threshold uh, is a fairly convoluted decision tree, which was based on um, expert knowledge within Parks New South Wales. Uh, I've tried to simplify it here into, into just a table to sort of indicate what it's checking. And broadly for every, every cell, every pixel in the map, it's going through and checking the fire intervals throughout the entire fire history that's available and also the time since the last fire. And it's making some decisions on that to identify the, the threshold for each individual pixel. Um, for some examples, first of all, it checks, is the vegetation fire intolerant? In that, if that's the case, then if it's been burnt, then we can say it's been too frequently burnt. If it hasn't ever been burnt, then we can immediately say, well, that's vulnerable because if another fire were to occur there, then that's going to push it out of its ecological thresholds because it's fire intolerant. We can then identify for a pixel, 
Um, if it's never been burnt, then clearly we can put it in the, the long unburnt category. And then if a fire has ever occurred at a location in the landscape, if a fire has ever occurred in a cell, then we go through and check each fire interval that's available in the history and work out, was it within the threshold or was it with outside the threshold causing it to be too frequently burnt? Has it been too frequently burnt in the past, but then it's had a long period of recovery, in which case we can specify that no, it's back in within threshold. And then also after checking all those past intervals deep in history, it also just uses the time since the most recent fire to once again determine um, is the time since fire longer than the maximum required interval, in which case it's long unburnt, or is it less, in which case we can say it's vulnerable, another fire will push it into the, into the too frequently burnt category. Um, the actual algorithm, as I said, is structured as a, as a decision tree um, to go through these various options, but this is an example of, of broadly some of the decisions it's making. And as I'll cover later in this talk, the algorithm is very much geared towards New South Wales parks at the moment, but I'm really interested in applying this around the country and talking to people in other jurisdictions who may have their own criteria for how they determine vegetation status um, and to see if I can implement some of those alternative algorithms that other people might be using within the fire tools framework. So some examples of the output once we've gone through all that. This, that, this is actually a broad scale analysis I did for New South Wales um, for the bushfire inquiry after the 2019-20 fires. This is what the fire tools output looked like before that season. So there's a fair bit of green there indicating within threshold. There's a fair bit of long unburnt around as well. After the 2019 fires, we see large areas going into the orange vulnerable category here, uh, and also areas getting into the too frequently burnt category. However, there's still a fair amount of long unburnt vegetation around, particularly in the south and around the edges. Uh, so we can clearly see the, the region the fires impacted, but we can see that a large area of the state is now in the vulnerable class where an, a subsequent fire over the next few years will push that vegetation outside its thresholds. So that's broadly how fire tools works and what it does. And what we're moving towards now is how we can get more value out of that analysis. Um, and so over the past few months, I've been working on extending fire tools uh, in a few different directions, which I'll talk about here. One is to build time series analysis into it so that we can actually look at not just the current year, but we can see how that year relates to previous years in history. Um, what has the fire uh, threshold status distribution across the landscape been in the past and how does the current year relate to that? Um, so that involves processing across the complete fire history archive, taking every year in the archive and essentially running fire tools individually for each year and building up a time series through time of what, what the map of vegetation status would look like. Another thing we're, look, we're looking at building on top of that are landscape metrics. So these are uh, statistical and geographic ways of measuring um, the relationship of various patches in the landscape. Um, the size, the connectivity, the, the evenness of various classes across the landscape and doing that analysis automatically on top of the fire tools output. Another thing we're looking at is integrating severity mapping in New South Wales. There's the FESM project, fire extent and severity mapping led by Beck Gibson. Um, we're having, trying to work out at the moment, uh, the algorithm for determining status does not take into account severity. It's simply interested in, did it burn or did it not burn? How long ago did it burn? It wasn't interested in the severity at which it burnt. And we feel from an ecological point of view, uh, that's quite important to build into this algorithm. So we're working towards that as well, which I'll show some examples of. And finally, we're building a version of fire tools that doesn't have to run on our web-based interface. We're building a version which can run on high performance computing environments. So uh, that will enable us to uh, process larger areas more rapidly. And that's necessary for some of these uh, other extensions like the time series analysis um, to let people use their own processing environments to run fire tools. 
because at the moment with fire tools being based on the cloud it essentially costs money for every analysis you run you click go the, the clock starts ticking and the processing uh, hours costs money but if people can make use of their own resources um, their own high performance computing servers to run it then that might be beneficial as well so time series processing here's an example of what this would look like for time since fire this is analysis an analysis we've run across the Blue Mountains region from the start of our available fire history, which was approximately 1950 until the present. Um, and for each of those years, we can see the distribution of the amount of the landscape uh, in hectares that within, was within each time since fire class over there with red areas indicating recently burnt not to five years where going into the blue and the green indicates a long time since fire. One thing to note about this is the white area. Um, these represent pixels in the landscape which within the fire history never burnt. And this is a problem we always face when analyzing fire history and doing fire ecology in that we have an incomplete record of uh, the fire history. As we go through and we collect more fires and fire mapping becomes more routine and more accurate, we get more fires in the database. Uh, so all these time series analyses have that issue, but obviously going into the future that will continue to improve as we have more complete fire histories for regions that we analyze. Um, you can see the clear feature here is that prior to the 2019, 2020 fires, there was actually a reasonably even distribution of time since fire across the landscape. You've got a complete sort of rainbow of colors there in 2018, 2019. And then the 2019-20 fires reset a huge amount of that landscape back to zero. Um, you, can, you can see that by looking at the time series here and, and the significant impact of that event. We can also do the same thing using those heritage threshold status categories we've done. So in this case, we've got within threshold as gray, long unburnt as blue, vulnerable as orange, and too frequently burnt as red. And you can see once again, the strong impact of the 2019-20 fires on those thresholds. Uh, a sudden switch from a about half the area being within threshold or long unburnt to suddenly a huge area switching to vulnerable. And over here, you can also see there's forward projection. So we've actually gone ahead and processed 2021, 2022, 2023. And we can see over that short time period, things haven't recovered enough to get back inside that within threshold. If we extend that out a few more years going out to 2030, then some of that forest will, will go back into that gray category. And so you get an idea of the recovery time. Um, another thing to see here is this graph here is just for the dry sclerophyll forests. With this time series analysis, we're building it so you can actually get summary statistics for specific vegetation types um, rather than just for the whole area. So the next thing we're building in our landscape metrics, just to uh, clarify what we mean by this, these are methods of analysis that try and quantify the structure of the landscape, not just the total area in a given category, but how those areas differ and are connected. So they give us statistics on things like the size of patches, uh, the shape of patches, whether they're simple circles or squares or whether they're convoluted shapes, the connectivity of different patches, how connected are uh, different, different types of landscape classes to each other. The aggregation of patches, do we have a few large areas in a given class or do we have lots of small patches? And also information about the area and the distribution of the area of those patches. Uh, and some of those metrics are quite useful for landscape fire if we want to give an, get an understanding of how spread out or grouped together are patches of long unburnt vegetation? Um, do we have large areas of the same class of recently burnt vegetation or a recently burnt area spread out in little patches across the place? So what we've done here is we've started to extend fire tools so we can do that time series analysis across some of those uh, landscape metrics as well. And this is something that's fairly new. We're still trying to understand which of these landscape metrics are really useful, but I'll give some examples here of, of what they look like. So the first one is a measure called effective mesh size. And this measures, does the landscape consist of 
lots of small patches of a given class, or are there a few large continuous stuck together patches? You can see here the time series once again going from the start of the fire history through to the present, um, and the 2019-20 fires are evident there as that really large peak uh, on the right hand side. And what that's showing is in the 2019-20 fire season, everything became, or a large area became one contiguous patch of vulnerable vegetation. Because the fire was so large, it essentially set a large area of the vegetation back to zero. And so everything became one large patch. Before that, it was actually a fairly fine matrix of, uh, of, of separated patches with, of different classes in between. So that might be a useful metric for identifying um, the structure of the landscape and how, how large uh, fire events uh, reset large areas which are connected together back to, back to the same class. Similarly here, we've got Shannon Diversity Index. This is an index which is often applied in ecology to look at species richness. Um, do we have, uh, it's measuring, do we have a diverse, even array of patches of different, differing um, time since fire? And you can see here again, uh, pre, before the 2019-20 fires, this was actually at a maximum. We had a fairly good diverse matrix of different times since fires across the landscape. Uh, after the 2019-20 fires, that diversity dropped uh, quite steeply and hasn't recovered over the forward, forward projections we've plotted there. And this is showing a lack of diversity in the landscape in terms of the fire matrix, in terms of, of the age class distribution of those, those different patches. Another one here, and I've plotted this trajectory separately for the four different um, threshold classes is the nearest neighbor dis distance, which is for a patch of a given class, what's the mean distance to the nearest patch of the same class? You can see here, one thing to note is before about 1980, the lines are going everywhere. And that's just down to that lack of fire history again, um, because not much had burned up until that point. Uh, we don't have much to go on. After the 1990s, you can see things settle down into a fairly stable pattern. But circling in green here again, you can see the 2019-20 fires. And the main thing to note here is that blue long unburnt line has a sudden increase. Long unburnt patches suddenly became much more distant from each other. It's a long way from one long unburnt patch to the next one. Whereas there was a sudden decline in the orange vulnerable class, vulnerable vegetation was suddenly much closer. And that's down again to a large area of the landscape switching to that vulnerable class after those fires. The next extension of fire tools we're currently working on, as I said, was integrating measures of fire severity. Uh, and we're working with the New South Wales FESM algorithm and the FESM data set. This is an automated process of fire severity mapping that happens for New South Wales after every fire uh, boundary is entered into the RFS database. There's an automated process which then goes and acquires satellite imagery and calculates the severity uh, across that fire. And as I said, ecologically, it's really interesting to try and integrate severity information into fire tools because we know that not all fires are the same, that a low severity fire may not have the same impact either on vegetation in terms of ecology or in terms of uh, its usefulness um, in reducing fire risk in the future. So we're really interested in trying to figure out how we can build that severity information into fire tools. Now that's a fairly big task because integrating severity into that algorithm will involve completely changing how that flow chart works, com completely changing how the decisions are made. And that requires incorporating a lot of ecological knowledge uh, for specific vegetation types in terms of uh, what fire severity means for fire intervals. So we're initiating a process of uh, elicitating expert knowledge um, from fire ecologists to start to do that. Um, but as a first cut, we're trying to do something a bit simpler, which is just to overlay the severity data on top of uh, the fire tools output. Um, so we'll do the fire tools output as usual. We'll get those four threshold classes, and then we put FESM on top of that. 
so we can see that a given area of vegetation might be vulnerable, but we also know whether the past fire was a low severity fire or whether it impacted the canopy. And that's hopefully something that fire managers can make use of when they're looking at the fire tools output to get a better idea about what went on. So this is what FESM itself looks like. This is a analysis that was carried out once again for the Blue Mountains region recently. On the left there, you can see FESM as it comes out of the satellite uh, processing algorithm has four classes, low, moderate, high, and extreme. To simplify things, uh, when integrating with fire tools, we wanted to break that down just to two simple classes. So here we've grouped the low and moderate classes together and called them no canopy damage. And we've grouped the high and extreme classes together. Uh, and that class we've called canopy damage or canopy loss. So that's the map on the right there where we've just got yellow areas with no canopy loss and red area areas with, with canopy damage. And the next, next step is just overlaying that on top of the fire tools output that we have. So the map here, you can see it's got those familiar fire tools colors with red for too frequently burnt, orange for vulnerable, blue for long unburnt, and so forth. Um, but there's also shading on top of that. So we can now see a darker orange that indicates vulnerable, but there was canopy damage. We can also see a darker reddish brown, which indicates that it was too frequently burnt, but there was canopy damage. And hopefully this is the sort of information that we can uh, give to fire managers and they can make better decisions about what the uh, understanding what the ecological status of the vegetation is based on that severity. Some classes are obviously impossible to map. Um, for example, it doesn't make sense that there would be vegetation which is both long unburnt and where there was a recent canopy fire. Uh, so some of the classes aren't useful um, and where they appear in the analysis, it's an indication of uh, possibly a misclassification of the fire boundary or of the severity or so forth. Um, but the main ones being able to see if vulnerable or too frequently burnt vegetation uh, has had recent canopy impact by the fire, I think is, is useful for looking at the ecological state. Oh, went too far. We're almost at the end. I just want to talk now about some of the future directions which we've seen here, um, which is integrating FESM, building fire tools into something that can calculate a time series, including projections into the future, um, and producing landscape metrics to understand the structure of the landscape. Uh, and as I said, we've been building this to run on high performance computing clusters. Uh, I'm also in the process of building this into an R library so people can easily run this on their own desktops a bit easier and breaking out some of these uh, processing steps um, so people can get to those intermediate results. And that includes things like easy production of fire history maps, time since fire maps, those sorts of uh, standard outputs that people often, often use when looking at the, uh, the status of the landscape in terms of fire. What I'm most interested in and why I've uh, asked to give this seminar today is I'm really interested in generalizing fire tools so it can be used outside New South Wales. As I said, it's quite flexible in terms of the data that it requires. You just need to give it um, a vegetation map, fire history map, and some lookup tables. Um, but the algorithm itself, which actually makes the decision about the vegetation status, was developed in New South Wales parks. Um, and I'd be really interested to talk to people who are interested in uh, doing a fire tools analysis over their own region and maybe implementing some of their own uh, logic um, in terms of what sort of vegetation classes, what sort of, what sort of vegetation statuses they're interested in and how they calculate those based on the fire history and the vegetation attributes. Um, and seeing if I can, we can build them into fire tools uh, to make it more broadly applicable across the country. Ultimately, we would love to have this as a national product that people can download or log into and upload their own data to for analysis uh, anywhere. Um, but I'd really like to hear from anyone who wants to talk to me to talk about building projects or collaborating um, to get this done. I think that's about it. Uh, thanks a lot. I'd love to go through your questions and answer them. Thanks.
So should I just go through these questions, Deb? Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, no, sorry. Yep. I'll just leave Grant's email address up there yeah. for one second, and then I'll stop sharing so we can run through the questions. Um, but it, um, once I close the, the slides down, if you did want to get in touch with Grant and you haven't got his email address, you can just get in touch with me and I'll pass your inquiry on to him. So if, um, if you've all busily finished writing that down, oh, look, um, my support team has gratefully put his email address in the chat box there. So I will stop sharing now. So we've got a couple of questions, Grant. Um, so uh, Paul says, thank you very much for the information. And how much does a pixel cover? Uh, when you run an analysis, that's completely up to you. You can enter the resolution you want, and that's the, uh, the resolution that we processed at. Uh, when New South Wales Parks does them, it usually does them the 25 metre resolution. Um, when I do maps of the whole state I show, the ones of the whole of New South Wales, that's an analysis I ran at 500 metre resolution. Um, and that just impacts the processing time. Um, if you choose a finer resolution, it does take longer to run. Great. Um, and Lawrence would like to know how you determine your maximum minimum fire intervals for each of the vegetation types. So is it done from expert opinion or peer reviewed science? I imagine in New South Wales, it's their, they've got their tolerable fire intervals well, well scientifically backed. Sorry, excuse my stumbling there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's uh, actually working out those fire intervals is a bit outside my remit. I'm working with the data that New South Wales has provided me, but yes, they have their tolerable fire intervals and they are, they are based on um, expert analysis and peer review science. And that's exactly the sort of thing I'd like to hear from, from other states. Um, because if you have that information for your own vegetation type, if you have maximum and minimum fire intervals that you've worked out, um, then it should be fairly easy to get it into fire tools. Uh, are there any other questions? Does anyone want to ask a question live? You can raise your hand and we can unmute you to talk to Grant directly. Oh, uh, Grant, you've got your hand I, up. I pressed a button. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, all right, well, I think that's really interesting. And I love seeing the way that the research community are coming up with these tools to help with prescribed burning planning. It can get very tricky and very complicated very quickly. And so the easier it is for agency staff to be able to sort of look at those um, maps and see at a glance, you know, where they may need to focus some of their attention for prescribed burning or not focus their attention in the, in case of the, the vulnerable communities. I think that's really great. And um, yeah, I'd love to see some of the other states, jurisdictions get involved and get in touch with Grant. So, um, Wait a minute, I think I see a question. Oh, so um, Paul, he um, wants to know, um, do you have any connection to state agencies in Victoria? Uh, a little bit. We are actually going to be running a trial uh, run of fire tools across the region of Victoria later in the year using some of the Victorian data and seeing if we can, we can <coughs> sorry, make it fit but that's at fairly early stages yet. Great. Yeah. Oh, now the questions are coming in thick and fast. <laughs> um, could you expand more on the perspective of vulnerability that is coded into the tool? From a loss of life and property perspective, vulnerability can be considered as vegetation that has not been burnt in a long time. But from an ecological perspective, vulnerable vegetation may be burnt too frequently. This also relates to the particular use of the bush. Yeah, look, the, the, the presentation I gave was pretty heavily focused on the, the second definition of vulnerable you've got there, which is the ecological vulnerability. Um, but a, a, I guess a part of fire tools I didn't cover very strongly, I sort of mentioned it at the start, is that you, it also processes fire management zones. Um, and it uses a separate algorithm for those. So if you've got SFAZ zones, strategic fire advantage zones around communities and so forth, 
Fire Tools actually uses separate algorithm and separate thresholds for those to particularly um, uh, give you a threshold for that vegetation based on, I guess, prescribed burning interest and risk to property interest rather than ecological thresholds. So I wonder if you can answer Ewan's question um, because you're, it is based on ecological thresholds about um, people involved in rebuilding standards to siting and construction guidelines. Do you think there's any um, use for this in the future in terms of um, looking at in those asset protection zones and building standards? Yeah, I think so. This is a side of it, like I said, it, it's got the capability in there to uh, implement whatever sort of algorithm you want in terms of determining thresholds, and that includes for those fire management zones. Uh, so I haven't worked much myself uh, with those stakeholders, but yes, I think, I think it could be useful. Uh, finally, a question from Damien. Does the output layer have the same compatibility to have spatial analysis, such as nearest neighbours analysis, to enhance our strategic fuel break work graphic representation? Uh, I believe so. I mean, though the output layers it's producing are literally the ones that I've uh, I run the nearest neighbour analysis on for those graphs. So it will give you back, uh, you know, a GIS raster file um containing those those classes for every patch of vegetation every pixel so you should be able to um, run standard gis or um, so forth analyses on them yep uh, now there's a couple of questions in the chat so um can the spatial data be replicated by local government area Uh, so to, to analyze a specific local government area, yeah, absolutely. You can you can provide whatever boundary of analysis uh, you want in it. Um, you can analyze a single LGA if that's the boundary that you, you can provide, provided there's there's vegetation and fire history um, data within that same boundary. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and how may coal burning play into this? Given the different fuel removal levels, does it have a different impact on the algorithm? Well, well, that's exactly right. And this is why I highlighted we're really interested into getting um, severity analysis into this. At the moment, the algorithm does not care about the type of previous fire. All fires are the same. It just cares about how, how frequently it burnt and how long ago it burnt. Um, but building that in and acknowledging that there are different sorts of fires and that cool burning has different impacts uh, on both the ecology and the risk is a is a road we really want to go down to to build on fire tools and have it have it incorporate that ecological knowledge. Oh, I wonder if there's a role for um, uh, not a role, but a place. You know, you had your two severity categories um, that, like cool burning, is even somewhat below the low intensity, and that you could potentially mm. put that in as as a separate um, severity level as well. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's that's exactly the sort of input we're trying to get from, we're going to start to get from experts to see what other categories would be useful as outputs um, to, to include things like cool burning. And another thing is, uh, at the moment identifies long unburnt vegetation, but having some indication of how long unburnt it was. Are we talking about hasn't been burnt in a century or are we just talking about hasn't been burnt in 20 years? So those are all things we want to start building in. Right. Um, Stuart would like to know, has consideration been given to building any other fire regime variables into the algorithm, i.e. season or um, post-fire impacts such as precipitation? No, that, that's really interesting. We have discussed season. Certainly people um, we've been working with in parks have um, raised the importance of season because a, a, a spring fire is going to be quite different than a summer fire potentially in its impact. Doesn't yet incorporate that, but that's that's a path we want to go down, definitely. Precipitation after fire, that's another really interesting one, but we haven't explored that much. Um, but you can, the more you go into this process, the more you, the more you see that it's, it's more complicated than simply how long ago was the fire. There are so many other variables going into it which influence vegetation condition. Yeah, and you know, we've got those sort of growth curves for fuel accumulation, but they may be starting to change under climate change. Now, are they, are they reasonable assumptions on, on fuel growth these days? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, another question, what role can this work play in assisting with prioritisation of burns? Well, that was the 
original aim of biotools that we can produce these maps and we can identify vegetation that's long unburnt. And once you look at that and take into account uh, the ecology of that vegetation and say, is this vegetation which should remain long unburnt or is this indicating that we have a high fuel load here, we need to prioritise burns to those areas. And similarly, identifying areas where you shouldn't burn um, because they're vulnerable. So as a first cut, um, it's, it just provides a good guide to fire managers into which, which areas of the landscape may be uh, have high risk in terms of fuel load because they're long unburnt and burns can be prioritised as such. Uh, another question, um, can you talk about the, um, how fire tools could be used for fuel load estimation? I wonder if it's at that level yet of um, applicability? Yeah, uh, one of the intermediate outputs, as I sort of showed in my presentation, is that it does give a time since fire layer, as well as a threshold status, it also gives you a map of time since fire. And obviously, if you trust Olsen fuel curves, um, then it's a fairly easy transform to take that time since fire and convert that into a fuel load. So we have done that, um, as once again, as part of our work for the, the New South Wales Bushfire Inquiry, that is exactly what we did. We linked those time since fire um, to, to fuel loads. But the fuel load question obviously is, is more complicated than that. So, yeah. Yep. Um, so Shane, who asked the LGA question earlier, um, wants to know, can the tool be geared towards the instance of fire in other environments, such as the built environment, perhaps as a layer, if that data can be supplied? Um, I think it'd be good to have discussions about what that would look like. Um, yeah, everything, everything I've shown so far is obviously geared towards natural vegetation and the fire intervals associated with it. Um, but within that vegetation matrix, there are built environments and it would be good to good to have a chat and think about what you would like to get out of it, what that would look like. Um, so we can see if that's possible. All right. Um, I think we have reached the end of the questions there, but I mean, uh, quite a, um, seems like there's quite a lot of interest in the tool and what it, how it can help prescribe burners. And I think you'll have a number of people reaching out to you from jurisdictions to, to get involved in putting their own vegetation layers in there, which I think is great. quite promising. So, um, so yeah, I'd like to um, wrap up the webinar, webinar? <laughs> webinar today and thank Grant very much for his time. And um, the um, yeah, basically that's it. And thank you everyone for coming. And um, as I said, you can reach out to me if you don't have Grant's email address and I'll um, pass it on to him. Great. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Thanks.